Welcome to the PDIA in Action event series. My name is Salima Samji, and I am the Director of the Building State Capability at Harvard Center for International Development, and I will be your moderator today. The format of today's session is as follows. I will begin with an overview of this event series, followed by a presentation before we open up for a Q&A session. Please feel free during the session to put your questions or comments in the chat. Matt Andrews and I co-teach MLD 103M at the Harvard Kennedy School. This is a field lab class where students learn how to use the PDIA approach, problem-driven iterative adaptation approach, by working on real world problems. They learn by doing. The students work together in teams with an authorizer or a client who gives them a problem to work on. This year, we asked the alumni of our Implementing Public Policy Executive Program to nominate problems for our students. Over a seven week period between January and March, our students worked with their authorizer to better understand the problem and to identify entry points. This event series showcases the learning of our students as well as our executive program alumni. Our topic for today's session is radicalization in France. And with us, we have our student team, Sasha Matthew, Imara Salas, Kishan Shah, and Katie Wesdick. Welcome. The students worked with Raphael Kennetsberg, a cybersecurity expert and an implementing public policy program alumni. I'd now like to invite Imara to get us started. Imara, over to you. Thank you so much. Just give me one second. I will start sharing my screen and we can get going. All right, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. It is so nice to see you all. Um, as Salima already mentioned, we are Kishan, Sasha, Katie, and Imara. And we will be presenting our PDIA group project, Addressing Radicalization in France. Before we start, we would like to thank Raphael Kennigsberg, who was our authorizer for this project and who's here as well, and the entire PDIA teaching team. So we began thinking about this issue, making a distinction between perception and factual trends. Since tw the 2015 attacks, there is a growing perception that radicalization is growing in France. So radicalization is a process by which members of society advocate for extreme reform that can result in violence and in the fracturing of society itself. This phenomenon covers a wide range of ideological views from religious extremism to far right and far left groups. Youth are particularly vulnerable to radicalization for reasons that we will outline during this presentation. In France, there is a national impetus to face this issue, but there is no consensus on how to approach this. And that's what we wanted to tackle in the construction of our problem. Um, so to begin with, several interrelated factors contribute to radicalization in France. On the one hand, French identity and civic values are informed by a long and complex history and contribute to a lack of inclusion of minorities and the marginalization of religions. In that sense, one of the factors that we identified is the narrowness of national identity. Another factor that we identify are cultural such as socioeconomic efficient community dialogue, counter radicalization policies that have created adverse effects, and the proliferation of extremist propaganda, which makes individuals vulnerable to radicalized ideas, and in particular, youth. Finally, we also identified individual factors, such as a lack of belonging, domestic instability, and, and violence and mental health issues that push individuals towards radicalized groups. Again, youth are particularly vulnerable to these last set of factors. And with that, I will pass it on to Katie, who will talk to you about the different iterations of her fishbone diagram. Thank you so much, Ima, and thank you again to everyone for being here today. 
Uh, so as Ema mentioned, in terms of the problem deconstruction, we utilize the fishbone diagram to be able to break down this very broad topic of radicalization and look at a lot of the different factors, the fishbones of what contribute to this problem. Uh, we, we labeled some of these fishbones with structural and individual factors where the structural are the tan boxes and the individual factors are blue. This was our very first attempt uh, where we were really taking a very broad look. We were really trying to zoom out and understand what is radicalization. Uh, as Ema mentioned, this is not something that's really easy to pin down and it's very challenging to define. So first to just get the big picture, we looked at some of the factors such as social exclusion and uh, lack of economic opportunities. That was um, a really big leading factor towards pushing some people towards seeking out something where they can feel included. Uh, we also looked at some of the clashes between uh, that national identity piece and specifically um, some religious minority groups like uh, Islam. We looked at where people uh, get access and exposure to extremist networks. So some of the, the really big points were places like uh, prisms and the, the internet. Uh, so those would be also areas we would look at. We looked as well as French colonial history to better understand the historical factors that have led to this uh, more recent push in radicalization as well as government policies that have further exacerbated these uh, issues. And finally, as mentioned, we also looked at some of those individual factors such as um, whether that be family connections, where you're getting exposure, mental well-being, and really try to understand what are all of the different ways that would push people towards uh, a decision of radicalization. We can go to the next slide. And so across the next six weeks, we worked to refine and narrow down what our fishbone was. And we wanted to look specifically at radicalization amongst the youth. So now you can see we have some updated fishbones. Again, the same labels where we're looking at structural and individual factors. Uh, so we looked at how people get exposure in terms of role models. And you, we, we saw that there was, um, some, some of the role models were coming from extremists. And we, we saw that this may come from religious leaders within the community who encourage radicalization. Uh, so that was something important to look for where people are getting role models from. We also looked at a lack of understanding around religion, how this is taught in schools, how it's talked about in communities and how we can make this a more inclusive um, understanding. We also looked further into where that exclusion comes from in terms of societal discrimina discrimination and marginalization uh, within communities. And again, the lack of economic opportunities. Uh, in terms of the individual factors, we looked specifically at the online exposure. That was a really big piece of this, um, as well as understanding why youth are so particularly vulnerable. Um, and a lot of that, we saw things like underdeveloped self-esteem, uh, when their friends are doing it, peer pressure, and other, uh, the search for group-based identity. Look at that next slide. Uh, so using our updated fishbone diagram, we tried to look for specific entry points for where we could maybe push things in a new direction. And we came up with these four specific ideas. The first focused on education. The second looks at misinformation around the internet. The third was looking specifically at the role of the private sector. And the fourth was about a corporate social responsibility initiative. Uh, so the educational curricular and toolkits would have been a way to, to sort of target that lack of understanding and see how we could uh, develop a better, uh, better awareness around different religions and, and create a more uh, positive understanding. Uh, for the second one with the misinformation on the internet, we wanted to really bring awareness around media literacy skills and see how we could uh, really reduce exposure to these networks through the internet. Uh, for the third, we, we wanted to look to see how the private sector could maybe help with uh, surveillance around the internet uh, as another option. 
And then finally, the fourth was really focused on community and how we could better understand uh, where we could bring in people who have already been working on this at the, the grassroots level. And with that, I will pass it to uh, Kishan to really uh, to show what, what we really did with those ideas. Yeah, before I go into the specific of those ideas, I think it might be interesting to um, maybe tell a little bit about the journey of our project and, and our relationship with Raphael as our authorizer. So I think Raphael sits at a really interesting position um, because when we first started working with him, uh, Raphael was already a cybersecurity expert working on cybersecurity issues in a large private company in France. Um, but he was also working with some civil society groups very closely connected with the French government on different public policy issues, including radicalization. And so uh, I remember when Raphael came to us, he had an initial idea or hypothesis that, you know, given his position and networks, um, it would be really useful to try and think about how can we uh, address radicalization through the private sector and within companies. And I think, um, you know, one thing we struggled with was thinking about where the entry points, um, where it would be possible to actually intervene, um, you know, particularly with Raphael's connections and his, his position within a private company versus where we saw a lot of the issues and problems, which had more to do with how communities engage with one another, um, how individuals within those communities feel marginalized or, uh, or feel connected. And it wasn't clear to us whether or not the private sector was even the right place for that type of engagement to occur. And so you'll notice on, on the previous slide where, where Katie showed those four entry points, um, it was really, I think, in the second or third week, uh, and Raphael himself came to us saying that, you know, uh, there's been a shift and we there's been some movement within the government as well as with the civil society groups I'm working with to focus more on the youth engagement education side of things. And so what I think the PDA process was really helpful for was because we were always focused on the problem, um, even though Raphael came to us and said, hey, we need to switch gears a bit here, or actually a lot, uh, it, it, it was actually really great. It, it didn't feel like something was amiss because by looking at that prog problem at such a large level at all the different factors, when Raphael came to us and said, we, youth engagement makes more sense, um, you know, the fishbone had part, parts on it and we could really engage on that right away. And so when we were thinking about where Raphael particularly and the group of people that he was working with could work on, um, these two areas around educational toolkits as well as misinformation really came up as places where they could really do something and where he was finding as well, through the partners he was talking to, some excitement as well. And so in particular, um, after discussing uh, with Raphael around all the different things that, that he and his group had the time to do, the resources to do, the, um, the framework of ability, authorization, and acceptability for, uh, these were the four ideas that we really came, came up with as potential next steps and first steps for thinking about how um, one might go about trying to address the issue of radicalization. So the first was uh, we really saw a big need for greater um, dialogue between organizations that were already working with communities um, and those that were working more at a national level on trying to solve radicalization from a policy point of view. And we found some really interesting NGOs and youth organizations that were already trying to talk to youth and work on radicalization within France. Um, and, and, you know, in, in some of our interviews with them, uh, we found that, you know, they found that their work was really impactful at an individual level, but they really didn't know how to scale it. Uh, it. It was really one of the ones that was most interesting was literally one woman who had a son who, uh, so, so she was um, an immigrant from Morocco uh, who was French and had a son who was in the French army uh, and who was killed in a terrorist attack. And pro after that attack would go to community to community, um, talking to youth, trying to help them, um, you know, overcome that alienation uh, and, and not join uh, radicalized groups. Um, and, and she was finding success, but it was literally just one person going to community community. And, and that's not really scalable from a, from a point of view of reaching every single person in France. Um, so then the other was connecting uh, with other experts and networks that are thinking about misinformation. Um, on our team, uh, we had some, uh, some local expertise um, with, with 
with uh, with some folks who had already been working on misinformation in other contexts uh, and in other countries. And so one area we thought that we could help was connecting Rafael and his team to some resources and people that were working on misinformation and how that might um, be relevant for the work that's being done in France. Um, the third was creating a repository of these best practices and research around the world uh, on values education and, and also combating misinformation. So the misinformation area, there seems to be a lot of work and research already there. The values education was something that, that, that we rediscovered was th something that people were doing, but was very new and, and very much untested. And lastly, the place where we thought um, as Raphael and his team was moving towards developing this toolkit and curriculum, um, we felt that the best place that we could possibly help him on was, uh, and, and given that this curriculum would be so new and so different from anything else that's already out there, um, what we could help is develop this action learning plan for how Raphael might develop this curriculum and test it over time. Uh, because it, it's, it, you know, a lot of this isn't going to come from just an academic exercise of analyzing the issue and figuring out what the content of the curriculum is. What really is going to matter is how it's delivered and how it is delivered for the specific context in French, in France, uh, where these youth and communities are. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. This is an overview of, of a draft um, of this um, learning action plan for creating this minimum viable product of this uh, curriculum and toolkit. Uh, and then the idea here was to work with Raphael to figure out what would be that first step that would allow us to take this idea, which was theoretical, and make it something that is concrete um, and testable. Because once it becomes something that's concrete that you can take to youth and actually iterate on, uh, that's where, you know, we saw from, from not just uh, our project, but the other teams, as well as the resources and, and advice from, um, from Salima and Matt, where the magic really happens, right? Is it's, it's when you have something, it could be half-baked, um, and it's taken to, to, to real life and tested, that you really learn or are able to make something that, that is completely different from, from what's out there before. And then for the last slide, end off with. So there, there are a bunch of different lessons that, um, that we learned across this, um, this, this process and, and project. Um, the one was specifically for this, this project. Oh, sorry, I'm passing on to Sasha for, for the lessons learned. Thanks so much, Kishan. Yeah, so just to close up with some of the lessons learned, many of which already came up over the course of the presentation. Um, we've divided it into the problem, the causes, the ideas, the entry points we discussed, and then teamwork and then PDIA, the PDIA process. Um, on the problem, as Kishan mentioned earlier, we were able to undertake a shift in problem deconstruction really quickly because we initially approached the problem very broadly. Um, one of the main things we learned is that it's difficult for private companies, the private sector in general, to play a constructive role in complex social problems like radicalization without necessary public and community level dialogue. Um, and then on causes, we learned that many causes are often, to complex problems are often profoundly intertwined. In this case, they also went to a fundamental level. So they basically went to the very nature of the French social contract, the social and political economy of suburban and urban France, and the lack of open civic dialogue on these issues. Uh, when it came to ideas and entry points, we gained a sense of the importance of very wide and thick engagement with community and domain experts. Um, what was challenging for us is also the logistics of arranging meetings during COVID. Uh, but this is also very critical to, this, to, the, to the success of many of our ideas, as again, as Kishan mentioned. Um, finally, when it came to working as, as a team, by uh, far and away, the most important lesson that we learned was the importance of psychological safety and investing, making investments and getting to know each other again, during a COVID time without the benefit of in-person meetings. This allowed us to be willing to take risks with each other and it really expanded the scope of what we could do. Um, and then finally, in terms of the PDIA process, probably the most important thing be, is, is getting live feedback from the interaction of your ideas in the real world. And the sooner you can test something, get feedback, iterate, the faster you can learn and move forward. Often the biggest challenges with this is, is moving from theoretical to the actual, which is in terms of authorization, in terms of fear of failure, uh, perfectionism, and then of course the, the ever-present logistical challenge. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much. I'd now like to invite Raphael to share his views on how this process worked for him. And as you heard from Kishan, through this process, Raphael also changed jobs and changed 
um, where he was working. So Rafael, please feel free to share that those details as well, Rafael. Thank you so much. Thank you, Counteract team. That was uh, amazing to see again what you did. <laughs> and I was very, very pleased to, to have the chance to work with you over these two weeks. Um, please know that uh, even if I didn't um, apply everything that you, you mentioned, uh, I used a lot of what you did. And basically, you helped a lot. Um, so I will just uh, make a quick uh, flashback. I, was, I, I used to work with BNP Paribas, uh, French bank, as a cyber expert, as Kishan said, and I just um, I just quit the, the company. I will be joining uh, next week the London Clearing House uh, subsidiary of um, London Stock Exchange as a deputy chief chief information security officer. Um, and in the meantime, I'm keeping my other job, <laughs> I would say, as a um, youth engaged. Um, uh, civil youth engage to the um, to, to bringing to uh, French people and French young people um, an idea of what is uh, what what the word defense means today, and to show that it's not only um, military world uh, that civil should also use that word to to spread the word ahead well um about that with a few friends we just created a new association called l'école marianne marianne uh, as you may know is the french allegory and that's our representation of what the republic is and uh through this new association we are aiming to um create a learning path um, to adults and mostly, um, I would say teachers or people who are working with young people. And we are aiming to teach them um, what is um, to respect the, the secularis secularism sorry, uh, concept the, um, and how to, to maybe prevent um, every type of radicalization in France. Uh, not only religious radicalization, um, it's very important to us to, to see uh, and to say that we, we have a lot now of uh, political radicalization. It can be far right, it can be far left. Um, and it's not all about Islam. It can be also about uh, Christianism, and different uh, other religions. So the, the association has been created. Um, it's on the tracks. Thanks to the Counteract team that are here today, um, we, we have launched the, the operations. Uh, we, I'm very glad to, to announce that we, we rose, sorry, the, the first uh, public subvention uh, last week, uh, the Homeland Security Department just um, gave us a, a lowest uh, 40,000 euro uh, as a start, and another 40,000 uh, euro, uh, 40, euro uh, will come from uh, youth department, sports department, and town minister. So that's very huge for us because we, we managed in very short time, I would say less than six months to bring together at the table uh, different ministries working on the same problem of radicalization um, that didn't use to speak together. So now we have those people around the table and we have a very uh, interesting uh, conversation with all of them individually. And we have a direct line of, and uh, as I would say, a direct authorizer, authorizer to each part 
of the public service, I would say. So that's very, very stimulating. And to, to come back on what you, you did on your work. Um, so on the last, on the, yeah, on the last part, you, you explained what was the, the MVP huh? um, that you, you, you created. Um, we slightly moved on that. Um, why? First, it was a bit ambitious. <laughs> that was uh, high rhythm. And obviously, we had to adapt to the end of the curfew and end of lockdown. So obviously we have open restaurants and bars now. So as we are young, <laughs> we like to go out. So obviously the rhythm is a bit, uh, a bit less than it used to be. Um, and yet we also had to adapt to the people who and the and institutions that, um, that allow us some money. So, for example, the, all the people that we have met, they wanted us to work first on the, on the primary model of um, Republican engagement contract. What is that? Is, um, is the Article 6 of the law on separatism that has been uh, voted a few months ago in France. And this contract is uh, by law um, um, something, a, a bound and a link between an association and the state. Um, the association is signing um, a contract stipulating that they will respect the values of the Republic and then uh, they won't spread radical ideas against the Republic values. So that's a bit uh, maybe utopia, but it exists. <laughs> so at least it's good. And all the public people that we've met told us that they wanted first that we issued a module on that, um, on that specific thing. So the first uh, module is, uh, is now in, in, um, on the track. We are working on it. And uh, the, the first MVP final product should uh, be released by the end of August or very early September. So it should be, uh, it should be available for teachers at the next uh, uh, school, uh, school year start. So that's that's very uh, stimulating, and then we will uh, we will of course think of uh, a lot on what you have recommended uh, on the week one, week two, week four, um, and the rhythm that you you, you recommend us um, on the way of shaping all the other products or sub uh, sub model that we will defined. So there will be one on secularism, secularism, sorry, one on what is Republic and Republic values, and one on what is radicalization, because we, we still have some issues in France to say the words <laughs> of what is radicalization. So that's very important. And teachers and all the people that are teaching now, they, they do need that because they don't have it. So uh, we are very, very glad to, to have the opportunity to work with you, with you four, and there is Merv who is missing today, but with you five, uh, thanks a lot on what you did for us. Uh, I, was, I was amazed, uh, to be honest, by your engagement in this, uh, in this course. Uh, I was uh, very surprised on how deep you could uh, go uh on this project and i was surprisingly uh, uh happy of your fishbone diagram because i used to work on that a year ago with salima and matt on the um, on the executive program and what you did was absolutely amazing because as you said kishan i had to switch you had to switch we adapted all together and at the end of the day, we have something very interesting. So thanks a lot.
uh, I hope that we can meet someday in real world. And I hope that uh, we can keep this, this bond. Thank you so much. Matt, over to you. Thank you very much, Raphael. First, you know, congratulations. It's really incredible that we went from January where you were at a different organization <laughs> to by August of the same year, you have a new organization, you have funding from the EU and you have curriculum that has been developed that will go live. And that is not a small feat to be able to do and all working virtually, uh, you know, Raphael, to your point exactly of hopefully you all <laughs> will get to meet each other in person because no one, not our student team, because we were remote this entire year, nobody has met anyone. And to still be able to have these conversations, to find these community groups, to be able to talk to them in France, have a language barrier and still make all of this progress is really commendable. And I really want to thank the student team for trusting us and for being able to, to just be very curious about this topic. None of them were an expert in this topic and they had to learn a lot in the process. And for you, Raphael, for trusting our students and us with giving us this huge complex problem to work on. Another thing that I wanna add before I pass it on to Matt is this point that the student team raised on psychological safety and how it's important. And, and I remember in our, in our second class, when we were talking about teams and te it's important for teams to be able to have that. Kishan actually mentioned to us, um, to Matt and me, and he said, yes, I get this, but it's really hard because we are on Zoom. How are we supposed to create psychological safety because we don't have the corridor conversations? H how are we supposed to build relationships when we're all a little box on Zoom? And that was, uh, it was an excellent question that he raised because it led to, we gave him some tips, but Matt had this idea of, he said, well, I have this crazy idea, but let's try it. And his crazy idea, which we have now learned is an incredibly powerful idea, is to offer an act of kindness. And so what we did is the students, the student teams would have to, would have to offer an act of kindness to each other and by the next week, and then they would have to share what it is that they had done for a team member. And we did that for two weeks. And then the third week we had them offer an act of kindness to themselves. And I think what we saw through that process and some students actually said, even though it was forced, <laughs> it felt forced because we told them you have to do this. You can pick who gets paired and, and switch it up, but this is what you have to do because you have to report on it the next week. They felt that it did lead to building more solid relationships with the student team. And I think that really helped for the teams to be able to be open with each other and to just say, I don't know how to do this. How, how should we think about this? And just be able to be open and bring their whole self into the team, as opposed to just, this is a course I have to take and let's just get this over and done with um, and then leave. So I just do want to thank Kishan for raising that and asking that question, because had you not, that would not have emerged in this process. But by you raising this really important thing, we tried something different and it worked and we're continuing to use it. In IPP, actually, they're in week three next week. And one of the assignments is to offer an, an act of kindness to each other all around the point of building psychological safety. Uh, Matt, over to you. Thank you so much, Salima. So, you know, it's, it's quite, a, quite a thing to, um, to think about the fact that, uh, um, uh, you know, I don't know which which of you have met each other, but I know that we've been with Raphael now, kind of together in a in a relationship for over a year, and I've never met him, um, and I I haven't met uh, any of the students that are here, um, and and yet you know it, we it, 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 I think value has been produced. Value has been produced in in individuals. It's been produced in building relationships that's being produced in Raphael's work um, in and 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 I think that one of the, the the enduring lessons I think we need to take with us about this kind of year is um, is is that hard things can be done 
you know, because I think at the beginning of last year, there was, I mean, it's the beginning of last year when, when COVID kind of hit, there was a lot of question about how do you do a course on implementing public policy when you can't build relationships? How do you teach about building teams? How do you think about psychological safety? And, um, and, and to be honest, I think nobody really knew. And, 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 and my sense is actually that um, some of those things that seemed impossible kind of really kind of worked well. My observation was that teams, online teams, work better than in-person teams than we've ever had. Um, I don't really understand it, but they did. Um, I think that some of these small things of kind of asking people to do the act of kindness, one of the things we observed was that um, in, in the groups where people were having difficulties, you know, when we talk about psychological safety, the idea is you create an environment where where people um, feel that they can speak truthfully and honestly to each other, but you also then create on the other side felt accountability, right? Where people feel that they're gonna be accountable to each other as individuals. And the, the, the challenge online is with both of those things is pretty daunting, right? If you, know, if, if you think about it, the old way in which you used to build teams is you would bring people together to some uh, retreat some offsite retreat and they would fall into each other's arms to build trust and to get to know each other and blah 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 all of that stuff right well I mean not only did we have in, not have any of that stuff we had much less than that you know people had never met each other people didn't know how to engage with each other so how do you make an environment where people who don't know each other and who are in different time zones different realities and 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 also facing different kinds of stresses to the norm that everyone is working through in a in a new way how do you get those people to feel comfortable with each other and to feel accountable to each other i i think what was fascinating to me about the act of kindness which really emerged more because i, I think we just got the sense from kishan's comment that we kind of, you know, people were struggling, people were having a hard time. Um, and I think what it meant in one of the teams, and not in this team, but in one of the teams, they were having real difficulty getting people to pitch up for meetings, getting people to kind of weigh in. And what it meant was that the ones who were doing things did the acts of kindness and the others didn't. And um, you guys probably didn't even notice that I, I'm talking to the team now. I don't think it was in your group. I think it was in the other group. But when we had people report on the act of kindness, it created this really interesting report back because a couple of people said, yeah, we did these things and the others didn't do it. And the others said, yeah, no, we're going we're gonna to make up for it. And it was a very interesting thing because often you find in teams, there's free riding, there's all of these challenges, right? And that was a very kind of almost a low stakes thing that right at the beginning dealt with that issue, right? And it was kind of fascinating. So for us, it was something that came out of it, which was a learning that I think hopefully we will take into other work. But I guess the point I'm trying to make was, this has been a long year. And, um, you know, it started with this journey with actually doing RPP with Raphael and his group and with Raphael and his group taking the risk on doing something that you know might have been from their perspective odd then it required you guys in the MLD class to kind of say well we're going to do a course on implementation well, one of the things that 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 Salima and I kind of wondered is is when do people kind of say how is anything being implemented when no one's working together but you guys seem to take that risk as well um, and, and it produces value. And I, I just want to encourage you guys, you know, policy, I actually think that this might be a year where many hard things are done that have been sitting on the back burner in many places because people were forced to do hard things. They were forced to meet online. They were forced to trust each other in different ways. That, that many of those things that actually, you know, we, we, we often say are too difficult. Sometimes, somehow they became possible because many other things were just much harder. Um, and and it's it's it. You guys all took a risk on it, and that's obviously the key the key dimension of this. So I want to applaud you all for taking that risk, um, and um, and and encourage you to keep doing it uh, because I think it's important. And keep doing it, even when people say, "Well, you know, how can you do something if you can't meet the people you work with?" Uh, you can. You know, how how can you implement when you can't touch and feel the thing you're working on? You can. Um, how can you be engaged in a topic that you know nothing about? You can. 
how can you work quickly on something that you starting you know from zero on you can and um and and it's not you know a motivational speech because you guys have been part of it right i think uh, at, the, at the end of january i don't think any of you knew anything at all about uh, about this topic and you kind of you 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 really helped rafael to to make progress and and for rafael you know one of the things that was also really challenging from the beginning from this group is working out how do you how do you do a public policy when you you're not in the public sector? Uh, how how does that work? And um, and I think that I think for you it's commendable. You know, you you didn't let that stand in your way, and you're kind of moving ahead, and you've done something in your private space. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see what you do in your new job, right? Where in your new job, it seems like you're working with an entity where maybe the vulnerability to these things is even greater. So. Um, so thank you all for for taking risks. Thank you for not letting things get in the way, and you know, um, keep doing that because um, the challenges that we face require that. They require you know taking risks personally. They require taking risks uh, professionally. And um, and I actually think that if 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 the last year teaches us anything, is it teaches us that it's really possible. And. Um, and um, so, so thank you, thank you, all of you, and the work itself. You know, just really fascinating, really interesting. There's obviously a gigantic amount still to be done, um, but you know, every big thing is just the accumulation of many small things. And uh, all of these small steps, if we keep taking them, will will get us there in the end. So, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Raphael, you had your hand raised. Yes. <laughs> I really wanted to, to thank you back, Selima and Matt, uh, for all you did for us um, over the last year, because uh, learning with you um, over the last year, I think literally helped us to, to overpass this situation and this crisis, because I think what you said and what you did was uh, speaking loudly um what everyone thinks and we're speaking about safe space obviously and kindness that should be natural and yet it's it's not so we have to listen to you and to listen to some people saying you should do that and that's the start so thanks thanks a lot to you and thanks again for this amazing sentence that i I still remember from the IPP class, and you were speaking about risk, Matt, but uh, uh, IPP is taking risk uh, to disappoint people at the rate they can absorb. And to me, that was all uh, that's illustrating what that journey, because if I didn't took the, um, the risk of disappointing the people <laughs> surrounding me, I think I wouldn't have worked with, uh, with the contract team. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, thank you. We're gonna kick off the, we have a few minutes left, so we'll take a few questions. And I wanna kick the questions off and ask all of the team, including uh, Raphael, what surprised you through this process? It could be either the work, the interactions, just what surprised you? And, you know, in any order, and I'll spotlight all of you, so you're all in, in the spotlight. I, I can go first. Um, so one of the big lessons was just uh, for me and what surprised me was how much of a sticking point the logistics was. And, and, and it seems like a little bit of a glib point, but I'll give an example. So um, very early on, and I see Fatin in the, in the audience. Um, so uh, Fatin is a classmate of mine who is, is uh, Moroccan and French. And I talked to her about radicalization in France and such. And she was the one that, that mentioned to me this organization, Imad, that was doing really amazing work um, in France on community engagement with, with youth in, in Serbia and France. And um, very early on, we knew we wanted to introduce them to Raphael and his team. Uh, this was like in week two, week three, we knew we wanted to introduce them. Um, it ended up taking four or five weeks to get the meeting to actually happen. Uh, and eventually uh, it was, so, you know, eventually we ended up taking a risk where we didn't even know whether, um, so it, it was actually quite funny because the emails that we would get from Imad were all in French. Um, 
and uh, and I, I we don't speak French, and they were like, we don't we don't feel comfortable talking in English, and I didn't know whether or not uh, we would have a French speaker to be able to have a conversation with them, but we were just like okay, we'll just set up the time anyways, and we'll figure it out. Um, you know, if we have a French speaker, we'll have one. If not, that's okay. And and eventually we did that, and Raphael was able to join his his partner, his one of his teammates was able to join, and Imar and I we just sat there and listened um, because we just didn't have anyone who who spoke French could understand. But that was the only way to get the meeting to to happen, and it was like those little tiny sticking points around getting these meetings to happen that that ended up becoming huge sticking points for what we wanted to actually do. And for for me, one lesson from that was just at at some point you just kind of have to take a risk and just like try and see if you can get something to happen. Otherwise, nothing will happen, and something is better than nothing. And I think along with that point, I, I can add something. I think what was really interesting about doing this project in Zoom was the fact that even though we were all really far apart, it sort of brought us closer together. And at one point, we just cold email a bunch of organizations doing something similar in the space. And it was really interesting how a lot of them reached out back to us and we were able to get documents from them, learn more about their work, um, and how that we were talking to organizations in Greece and in Germany um, and in the UK. And I think that would not have been possible were we not on Zoom and everyone was in their computer sort of 90% of the time during the day. Um, so I think that was an interesting aspect of uh, our work as well. And to add to that, I think what surprised me the most was just how effective the the group dynamics could be. I we had talked a lot about that when we were getting introduced to PDIA, as was mentioned with the the acts of kindness, like those bonding pieces that had been emphasized as being part of the process. Uh, I was really amazed by how far it actually enabled us to go and how much we were able to get done week to week. Um, I really liked how fast paced that the the work was and how we were able to go from this very, very broad understanding of a pretty complex um, topic and be able to narrow it down and actually be able to generate ideas that could be helpful. So I, I just was really amazed by just how impactful it was to actually have those really positive dynamics. It was probably the most effective group I have worked with at HKS. I guess um, for me, the thing surprised me the most is that uh, before this class, this is not a problem I would have touched. Honestly, I would have thought that this is too complex a problem. It's something to stay away from. But I think PDIA did that for us. It gave us a, a process, a handle, how to get a handle on really complex problems, just the deconstruction, the fishbone, the sequencing and rationalization of entry points. All of that showed us, showed me at least, I think that I, that, you know, complex problems are not a thing you need to kind of avoid actively. finish <laughs> thanks a lot but um i was really amazed by the, the rapidity of adaptation that uh, that katie sasha um uh, imara kishan and merb um performed that was like something you know we just uh, spoke I, I guess one one hour at the beginning and i just explained what i was trying to do I think it was not super clear because it was not very really clear in my mind as well. And then you decided like to jump on and see what you could do and see what you have done. So bravo. Wonderful, thank you. We have two questions from the chat that I'd like to voice. There's Pedro and Katija too. If both of you can ask your questions and then the team and, uh, and Rafael can answer both questions. Thank you, Pedro. Okay, thank you very much, Salama. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot for such a wonderful presentation. It was really great to listen to you all guys, very enlightening. And well, just going back to the issue of radicalization, my, and I think in particularly in the case of France, uh, Raphael could please correct me if I am wrong, but uh, do you think that there is any uh, 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 play for the, say the big organized religions in France right now, I'm thinking mainly in the Muslim and Catholics now, 
to address the issue of radicalization and to work uh, together with other players in, in, on this issue? And if the answer is yes, uh, how, uh, how do you think that they could be engaged you know, to, to work productively with other NGOs or the government as well? That's a, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, Raphael, before you answer, we'll just take the second question as well so that you can, you can all answer both questions. Um, Katija too? Yes, hi, thank you all for this wonderful presentation and work. Um, so my question is somewhat similar to Pedro, but on the state side. So um, within your project, are there any provisions for how the French state um, can kind of meet with people halfway um, to address some of these issues that you found and some of the solutions that you're proposing? I think I could jump in um, a bit with the first question. Um, I think that the, so the first question being how could we incorporate organized religions? Um, this was actually a, a really big piece that we looked into it and we, we stayed pretty broad with the presentation, but with uh, the community involvement entry point, this was really important. Um, and we, we actually looked to some of these grassroots organizations uh, in different religious communities, how they were combating radicalization within their own communities and neighborhoods. And uh, they were really good examples uh, for how to engage in a more, in a, in a very positive way. Um, some of these organizations even brought in formally radicalized members to speak to the community about the consequences and, and trying to uh, veer people away from that same path. So I think that the that the religious organizations that were, uh, the, I mean, they're the most aware of, of what's going on within their own community. So I, I think being able to tap into both from a large scale, how can we incorporate better understanding amongst the different religious groups and at the community level, um, that, that was a really big inspiration piece for us of how to move forward. All right, thank you very much. And if I can add, um, thanks a lot, Pedro, for the, the question. Um, I would say in France now, the, the political slash religious uh, dialogue is pretty hard. <laughs> it's always have been like that, but today it's even, even harder. Um, I would say that there is something to do uh, for incorporation and that the state should, but he is working on that and they have a lot of problems to actually implement it, but they should try uh, to create um, something like the consistoire, which have been created by Napoleon uh, for a Jewish community, um, which is mainly a, a direct bond between the religion and the state. I mean, this religion and the state. And it, it has been tested uh, some years ago um, on the Muslim cult. And it didn't work uh, because uh, there was too there were too many uh, different branches, and it never it never worked. So there is something to do, and I would say the the most beautiful thing on that would be to have a, a maybe a, um, three religion working all together. I mean, the three main uh, monotheist religion. <laughs> Uh, working all together uh, on the same way with the state. And that should be very interesting. That should be very difficult too. Indeed. Thank you very much, Rafael. And thank you, Katie, too. Did any of you want to add anything to those responses? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the two questions, um, as someone mentioned, they were related. I really do think they're, they're, they're actually really the same question because um, one of the things that was really surprising to me was, uh, you know, I, I was I was born and brought up in the United States, which has a very specific, um, it, I think there's a specific understanding of what church and state and secularism means. Um, my family is from India, and in India, there's a different meaning for what secularism means. Um, and I think France's notion of what secularism is, is completely different from those two. And and it, it's it's a, almost a complete absence of, um, of overt 
even talking of or dialogue on or mentioning of religion, um, except in like certain circumstances. And, and that is an, a problem because it means you don't have a language or um, a habit or a sense of how would you even talk about these issues in a really meaningful and a constructive way. And I think uh, one thing that was a theme that came over and over again was this lack of language and dialogue and ability to even talk about the issues um, without feeling uncomfortable or without uh, being able, without, without, you know, just essentially changing the subject um, means that you end up doing things that are counterproductive, right? And, and I think uh, the reason why I think this, this curriculum and toolkit idea is so important is because it, you need to start fostering those skills, the skill to be able to talk about these issues. And until you do that, uh, you know, it's difficult for the state or organized large entities to be able to, to take that on. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this session. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I want to thank Raphael for working with our student teams. And I would like to thank Imara, Katie, Kishan, and Sasha for doing an excellent job on this and trusting us and, and learning so much. And really, um, I think our expectations of, even when Raphael first mentioned this topic, it was so vague, we said, um, Let's try, let's see what happens with not much expectation and look at where we are today. And for that, it's because of all of your hard work and, um, and trusting us. So I really want to say thank you to each of you. And I hope that you can use some of the tools that you have learned in this class in your, um, in your careers. Matt, did you have anything else to add? No, I don't have anything else to add, just... Uh... A great session and a great um, piece of work from everybody. And again, thank you to everybody. And uh, I hope uh, I just wish you all well uh, in, in, in what you're doing and where you're moving to um, in the next steps of your careers. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. That concludes our PDI in Action event series. Thank you all. <laughs>